Hi, I'm Catherine Bruton. Um, Refugee Week is all about, it's a UK-wide festival that is all about celebrating the contribution, creativity and resilience of refugees and people seeking sanctuary. It's about giving voice to people who've sought safety here in the UK and it's about promoting understanding of the reasons why people become displaced, the challenges they might face, but also the incredible contribution that they make to our society. Um, this Refugee Week VIP reading have teamed up with O's Refugee Team, um, raising money um, to bring emergency aid to people and projects working with refugees on the ground. Such incredible and important work they're doing. And I'm really proud to be supporting that um, as part of the VIP Reading Week. Um, because my book, No Bad Issues in Syria, is really inspired by so many of the incredible refugee children that I have had the privilege to teach in over 25 years of teaching. Um, children, I, refugees who have come from Angola, from Namibia, Mozambique, from Rwanda, from Bosnia, from Afghanistan, from Syria, from the Ukraine and many more places. Children who have amazed me with their incredible resilience, courage, talent, good humour um, and whose voices will always stay with me and who this book is an absolute tribute to. Um, I really hope this book will actually inspire so many refugee children to go away and tell their stories so much better than I can have told them. But in the meantime, this book was about trying to give voice to some of those children who sometimes feel their stories aren't heard and have told me that. And also about encouraging people to look beyond the labels of refugee and asylum seeker. Because this is the story of Aya, an 11 year old um, girl who comes from Syria with her mum and her baby brother seeking asylum in the UK. She stumbles across a local ballet class and the teacher, Miss Helena, uh, reckons that Aya has a talent to win a scholarship to a prestigious ballet school. But she has so many challenges to face from prejudice, but also um, her family um, trying to seek asylum and, and, and not knowing whether they're even going to be staying in the UK and also not knowing what's happened to her father who has gone missing on a perilous journey from Syria. Um, this is a book that I'm, I've, I, I've loved writing um, and um, I'm going to read you a little bit from the first chapter to give you a taste. Aya could hear the music floating through the walls and the woman's voice. One, two, pour the bra, lift those arms, girls. Three, four, straighter, yes, five, six, elongate. The notes of the piano seemed to trickle down through Aya's limbs and her fingertips moved involuntarily towards the tune that tinkled through the stuffy air. The music stopped. Aya wiggled her toes and glanced around. The community centre was crowded, a jumble sale collection of people talking in a bustle of different languages. Hot sun spilled to the windows and the room smelled of soup and unwashed clothing and sadness, Aya thought. She sighed and shifted in her seat. The music started again and Aya glanced upwards. The piano notes were coming from somewhere close by, upstairs. If she closed her eyes really tight and focused hard enough, she could almost, almost imagine herself back home in the dance studio in Aleppo, with the heat on her limbs, the white hot sun falling through the skylight and the aromas of the city trickling through the windows, dusty streets and car fumes and incense. She smiled as she remembered standing at the bar and tracing her pointed toe through a series of rond de jean, recalling the dust that sometimes trickled across the floor that drove Madame Belova mad. Anyone looking at Aya at that moment would have seen a small girl who looked much younger than her 11 years, holding a sleeping toddler in her arms. She had her eyes closed and a curious expression danced over her face as her small foot traced circles on the grubby floorboards. A headscarf covered her, her, her black hair and the clothes she was wearing were too big for her. Leggings sagged over her skinny limbs and an old dress which might perhaps once have been her mother's hung limply off her tiny frame. And yet there was something about the way she sat, the bird-like tilt of her pinched face that made her seem as if she belonged somewhere different. The sound of the music stopped and Aya wriggled on the hard plastic seat. 
She was hungry, and Musa was getting heavy in her arms, and the music made her feel fidgety and restless, and something else that she couldn't quite find the word for. She shook her head determinedly and sat up straight. She needed to be focused today, to help Mama. How long do you think it will be? She asked the woman next to her, who just shrugged. Aya wasn't sure she'd understood. She glanced round again. They'd been waiting for three hours just to talk to the caseworker, a young man with a beard and tired-looking eyes who sat behind a makeshift desk, papers and piles filed up around him. Right now, he was talking to Mr and Mrs Masood, the old couple from the hostel who told Aya that they came from Damascus. Aya could hear the words, Application for asylum. Appeal. Lawyers. Undocumented. Hearing. Same old story, she muttered to Musa. Right, Moose? Over and over, wherever we go. Musa shifted in his sleep, making a funny little sucking noise that made Aya want to just squeeze him tight. You sound like a baby rabbit, Moose, she muttered, planting a kiss on her brother's grubby, tear-stained face. His face was damp, his hair was damp with sweat. His fingers clasped tightly round Aya's thumb, and she remembered the very first time she'd held him, and the feeling, the wave of love that she'd felt then, and a feeling that she'd had that she was never going to let anything happen to him, not ever. Don't worry, Moosey, she whispered into his damp cheeks. Aya's here. Aya's going to sort it all out. I promise. Mama was sitting next to her. She looked tired and far away. It won't be long now, Mama, Aya said. But Mama did not reply. She just kept staring up at the dusty windows as if she could see something through them that Aya could not. You okay, Mama? Aya asked. Are you hungry? I can get some food. There's soup today. But Mama said nothing. Just then, the door to the community centre swung open and music spilled into the room again, louder now, and a quicker piece was playing and Aya found her toes tapping out the beat on the floor. One, two, three, squeeze, two, three, the bar, two, three, and photograph. Lovely ladies. Aya held her breath for a second. Photograph. She muttered half to herself and half to Musa. Madame Belova liked to say that too. Photograph. It meant a moment of stillness, a pause, a catching hold of the music and waiting with it, the notes and the dancer just suspended in time, hovering in the air, just for a second. Suddenly, Aya couldn't sit still a moment longer. She glanced at the queue of people in front of them. It was still going to be ages before they were called. She could slip out just for a moment to go and look. Mama, I'm just going out. I, I won't be long. I promise I'll be back to help. And then I'll, I'll get some soup and some bread because you need to eat, okay? Mama turned and nodded, but she seemed to have only half heard. I'll make sure she eats properly today, Aya said to herself, and I'll rub her temples the way Dad used to do when she got one of her headaches. And then I'll talk to the caseworker, and I'll get everything sorted, and then Mama will be able to relax and get better and be herself again. Aya carefully uncurled her little brother's fingers from her own and laid him down gently in the battered pushchair that Sally, the nice young volunteer who ran the refugee centre, had found for them. Then she stood up and did a little spin on the spot, which, just for a moment, made old Mr Abdul opposite think of a curling autumn leaf falling through the air. But Aya was unaware of being leaf-like as she made her way to the doorway. She just needed to shake off the fidgety feeling that the music had sent trickling through her limbs before she burst. I hope you'll enjoy reading No Ballet Shoes and many of the other incredible books in the VIP reading box. But most importantly, this Refugee Week, I hope you remember the message of No Ballet Shoes in Syria, which is to keep spreading the kindness, keep spreading the kindness and spreading the hope across the world and across the UK and in your own communities this Refugee Week. Thank you.